Hey guys, this is Rudy coming at you live from Palm Beach in Florida. It's time for me to uh, wear my Occidental Petroleum hat again and be Mr. Oxy uh, at least for one more time. Uh, you know, uh, for those of you who've been following me for about three years, um, Occidental Petroleum was that diamond in the rough that I found that you could buy for less than $10 per share uh, just over, you know, two and a half, three years ago. But a lot of things have changed since then. Uh, we saw, uh, you know, large institutional investors like ICANN withdrawing from Occidental Petroleum, and we saw large institutional investors like Warren Buffett or Berkshire Hathaway, who were already invested arguably anyway through their preferred shares, uh, get into Occidental Petroleum, and uh, as a result, help push the share probably, uh, arguably, beyond its worth up to about $77 at its peak at one stage. Uh, I do want to spend uh, a little bit of time and uh, have a serious discussion about Occidental Petroleum and where we are today. And uh, and then I'll tell you where I'm at and sort of where what I'm thinking, but uh, make no uh, mistake, Occidental Petroleum is no longer the uh, shining light that it was uh, back in 2020 when you had an opportunity to actually climb into this thing, boots and all, as I said, at around you know, $10 a share or less. My personal cost basis is around $12, but more about that in a second. So uh, what I'm going to do here is sort of uh, two sections, if, if as it were, might be a little boring, especially for people who have not watched uh, any videos on my channel before, because uh, what I'm doing first is going through the 10K, which is the annual filing for 2022. And don't worry, I'm not going to show you all uh, 250 or 300 pages of it. I've just captured a highlights reel, and then I'm going to go into the 8K, which is the um, fourth quarter result very, very briefly at the end and uh, talk about this uh, sort of... I want to say hits and misses, but there are no hits, just misses, misses on the top and bottom line. Uh, Oxy uh, reported buck uh, 76, which is about 12% below the uh, analyst expectations. And usually I joke and uh, say analyst, analyst, and maybe the analyst got it wrong. Uh, this time, I'm afraid the analyst got it right and Occidental failed to deliver. So uh, let's quick uh, take a quick look at Occidental Petroleum and see if we can figure out where it's gone wrong and what is going on with this company. So shareholder return, this is uh, some good news here. Capital is returned to shareholders through Occidental's dividend and share repurchases. Occidental current dividend is 18 cents per share per quarter or 72 cents on an annualized basis. Now, I just mentioned that my cost base is $12. So if uh, Occidental is paying 72 cents as a dividend, that's approximately 6% on my cost basis as an annual yield. And probably the only reason why I would still hold Occidental rather than just dump it, boots and all. Now, to be fair, uh, with Occidental trading at around $60 and my cost base is at around $12, I'm sitting on a 5X gain, which is well over 300%. So, um, you know, I can really complain uh, in terms of where it's at on my portfolio. Uh, it's still looking my portfolio from an energy point of view, look very, very good because of the gains that I achieved having bought Occidental for 12 bucks and seeing it even now trade at $60 is pretty good. The fact of the matter is this, I have some foundational stocks. Uh, Occidental is no longer a growth stock. And if it pays me a 72 cents dividend and it doesn't cut the dividend, it's I'm earning 6%. If it increases the dividend and buys more shares, then my yield is even greater. So for that reason, Occidental moves into my bucket of foundational stocks and it's no longer a growth stock. And uh, I would be very, very hesitant to even buy it at 60 bucks. Uh, it's pretty much steady eddy from here on in, and you should not expect too much gains from Occidental um, if you're long in Occidental. During the fourth quarter of 2022, Occidental completed its $3 billion share purchase repurchase program. So this is important because during the fourth quarter, Occidental completed its $3 billion share repurchase program. And what did we see as a result? Occidental pulling back almost 20%. In February 2023, this month, the board authorized a new share repurchase program of up to $3 billion of Occidental shares of common stock in 2023 with the intention to begin redeeming the preferred stock. These are good news, uh, sort of uh, agenda items and nothing to scoff at. And right at the bottom of the screen here, you can see that um, Oxy had basically repurchased their shares at around $63. So uh, even the shares that they repurchased, which were cheap at the time at $63, is now 10% cheaper at 57, 58 bucks. Okay, let's continue here. The performance graph. So firstly, currently uh, I have a whole plethora of uh, analysts 
um, basically giving us an indication here of what they think or where they think Occidental is going next. And you can see I have, uh, what's this, 23, 26, 28 analysts. This is, these are uh, analysts globally, not just in the United States. Three are still saying buy. They are very brave. Eight are saying outperform. Uh, uh, probably, you know, at, uh, in the high 50s, uh, you could possibly uh, tag an outperform rating on Occidental. 15 say hold. That's much more representative of where you should be right now. You should not be buying Occidental. And you probably shouldn't be selling Occidental either, but you can certainly hold it. And only two people say it's going to underperform from here on, uh, from this point forward. But we'll have to see what happens to the commodity because unlike many companies, Occidental is absolutely inextricably linked to the price of the commodity, which they cannot control. Down here at the bottom, you can see um, if you look at the performance graph, it's comparing the yearly percentage change in Occidental's cumulative total return on its common stock with the cumulative total return of the S&P 500. So uh, when you make this comparison and you look down here at the bottom, if you had invested $100 in Occidental in 2017, which was probably a bad time to get into the stock, a much better time would have been in 2020 when you could have bought Occidental for as low as $10. But even if you bought it for 30 bucks, you know, you're up 100%. So you're probably not uh, too dissatisfied with that in terms of where we are right now. However, if you had simply bought an S&P 500 uh, index like SPY or something like that, uh, you would have been up significantly more than what you are up on Occidental today over a five-year period. And of course, the the, um, the inverse is true here because if you had bought an S&P 500 uh, index at around 2020 for 150 bucks, you're only sitting on 150 now, so uh, you haven't gone anywhere at all. But if you had bought, bought Occidental Spear Group at $65, you would have been at $145, uh, which is a pretty good gain itself. That's one of the reasons why I like XLE, because it gives you a bit of diversification, because XLE is literally 20% Chevron, 20% Exxon, and then uh, bite-sized increments of about 5-7%. Uh, some top companies in the United States, including EOG Resources, ConocoPhillips, etc. So uh, if you need to park money in energy, right now with energy being relatively uh, low, uh, and pretty much arguably the entire market is relatively low, but if you... Uh, want to hold some energy stocks, the easiest thing for you to possibly invest in is XLE rather than a single individual stock. Let's look at this on a picture. So uh, again, it depends on your timeline and your time frame. For the majority of you, you only met me in 2020 because that's when I started making videos. And as I mentioned right at the start, at that point in time, I actually literally uh, became Mr. Roxy because the uh, community affectionately referred to me as Mr. Roxy because I found this diamond in the rough which was going to make us all a lot of money. I hope you did too. And uh, I hope you, if you're long on Oxy, you're still sitting on large gains. Since then, we saw it spike in 2021 and pull back in 2022, despite the fact that in most of 2022, the prices for energy were still high. So uh, in Occidental Petroleum, uh, 2022 is probably a peak year for us. Uh, and uh, now we're seeing some pullback in that particular segment as it relates to energy. The black line at the top here is the S&P 500. You can see, obviously, the market has pulled back while Occidental was still going up. But those glory days are behind us now, so you need to pay careful attention to your investment and how you manage the investment in Occidental Petroleum specifically. General, so this is your macro thesis, right? In 2022, as, as compared to 2021, the average annual price per barrel of WTI crude increased to $94.23 from $67.91 the previous year, and the average annual Brent price also the return of oil demand to its pre-pandemic levels, the ongoing global impact of the Russia-Ukraine war, and the limited increase in supply in 2022 have resulted in an increase in benchmark oil prices year over year. As behind us now, uh, the market that we are trading in currently is very, very different, so you need to be aware of the macro. Occidental does not operate or own assets in either Russia or the Ukraine. It doesn't matter. You get impacted regardless of where your assets are located. It is expected that the price of oil will be volatile for the foreseeable future, given the current geopolitical risks, the ongoing global impact of the Russia-Ukraine war, and uncertainty around the global economy. Uh, of course, there are many people who say we are already in a recession, and there are other people who say we are heading towards a recession. I'm in the aforesaid group. I actually think we are already in a recession. It's not a very deep recession, but uh, if you ask me for my humble opinion, I think it could get worse before it gets better. Oil demand in China as it emerges from its zero COVID 
policy. Well, that's debatable too, because we don't know on a day-to-day -day basis what's happening in China, and most of the mainstream media reporting is fake. Production levels in OPEC and non-OPEC oil producing countries and further releases from or additions to the US Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is pretty much almost running on empty. Uh, you can sort of just glean from the macro that I'm sharing with you that in addition to all these geopolitical risks and other things that are happening, uh, the uh, oil industry is being targeted with guns blazing from almost anyone who has any level of power in the world, including politicians, your favorite politicians and mine, <laughs> assuming that you even have a favorite politician. But um, oil is under attack. And uh, arguably, given the fact that oil is under such incredible attacks from all over and from all angles, it is amazing that it actually is holding as strongly as it does. Occidental works to manage inflation impacts by capitalizing on operational efficiencies. Good luck with that. You can control your operational efficiencies in a in a uh, an environment where inflation is just roaring and there's nothing you can do about it. Locking in pricing. So there's two factors here, right? So in the first place, you have the commodity pulling back and you have inflation pushing the prices up higher. So uh, this is a double whammy. It's almost impossible to defend yourself in, in that kind of a situation. Locking in pricing on longer term contracts and working closely with vendors to secure the supply of critical materials, sand, steel, everything they use, costing them more in addition to human resources. As of December 31st, 2022, substantially all of Occidental's outstanding debt is fixed rate. That's a good thing because at least it's predictable. Oxy aims to maximize shareholder returns through a combination of returning capital to shareholders. Well, they've been doing that, right? They did a $3 billion buyback and the shares moved just a smidge, lower, not higher, right? While redeeming a portion of preferred cash equity, sorry, preferred equity to continue improving Occidental's financial position, which is a good idea. Enhancing the existing asset base to new investments, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go through all of that. It's too much information. Debt and interest rate swap. Strong cash flow in 2022 allowed Occidental to continue its deleveraging efforts. In 2022, Occidental reduced its debt principal by more than 10.5 billion, an outstanding job by the management. What has it done to the share price? Absolutely almost nothing. In fact, the reverse. It uh, caused the stock to even pull back more. Uh, one, of, one of the challenges that I have with Occidental Petroleum is as good a job as the management has been doing in terms of managing CapEx and operational expenditure, um, unfortunately, you cannot control the uh, CapEx and operational expenditure in roaring inflationary climates. So uh, you're in a situation where you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't, right? They had to cut costs and they've cut costs as best they could. And they're still effectively spending more than what they did before. But more about that in just a minute. I'm going to show you the financials in just a second. Debt ratings. As of the date of this filing, Occidental's long-term debt was rated BB plus by Fitch. That's their best rating. Uh, Occidental believes that the deleveraging de performed to date may lead to future ratings upgrade, but cannot determine the timing of any potential ratings change. They have no control over the ratings change whatsoever. If Occidental gets downgraded more, it'll cost them more and they'll have difficulty uh, tapping the capital markets for more money should, they need, should the need arise. On the other hand, if uh, Occidental achieves investment grade, uh, which is better than the current uh, ratings, then um, they could save some money on interest and obviously have uh, better access to capital. But who knows? Kind of like the price of WTI and Brent. Uh, you just don't know. You can't control it. The oil price of the gas environment. So here you can see if you compare 2022 with 2021 in the middle of the uh, slide here towards the right, uh, you have a 2022 average price on WTI, which is Occidental's primary product, $94 and in the previous year, 67. That's a 40% change. Well, we didn't see that. 40% change in the commodity price materialize in order to give us gains. The gains that we achieved last year were primarily as a result of Berkshire Hathaway buying Occidental hand over fist rather than Occidental's uh, exceptional performance in a high price commodity environment coupled with better cost management or low costs in terms of what management could do to affect the prices that they pay for whatever it is that they required to run their business. In 2023, Occidental expects to continue development and expansion of its existing assets in the Gulf of Mexico. Not a bad idea. Occidental plans to conduct development and exploration activities in 2023 using one or two, one to two floating drill ships, one platform rig, and several other well service vessels. Um, so they're still looking at expanding and growing that part of the business. Now, we always hear about Oxychem in every uh, chat 
that you hear from Vicky Holland or from the management. Uh, Vicky usually starts off with uh, Occidental Low Carbon Ventures, which right now is a nothing burger because there's nothing there. It's not generating any revenue. And uh, we can talk it up as much as we want because it's a great idea when you talk about uh, direct air capture and uh, you know things like that. But at the end of the day, there's no money, right? So right now, it's, it's sort of almost uh, the same as a miner that is um, not producing anything, they, uh, either in exploration or development stage because it's not generating any income. Oxychem is a favorite for Occidental because uh, Oxychem is usually profitable. But to be fair, it's such a small slither of Occidental's revenue that in the greater scheme of things, it only matters from the point that it boosts the bottom line rather than the top line from a revenue point of view. That's the macro. The business strategy, the midstream and marketing segment strives to maximize value by optimizing the use of its gathering, processing, transportation, storage, and terminal commitments, and by providing the oil and gas segment access to domestic and international markets. You can read that sentence 10 times if you'd like. They're actually saying almost nothing. Occidental says, the decrease in net deferred tax liabilities in 2022 compared to 2021 was primarily driven by the legal entity reorganization that Occidental undertook in the first quarter of 2022. This is a critical thing. I've mentioned this before in other videos. Some people shot me down for it and said, like, almost, how dare you, Mr. Oxy? Um, the fact of the matter is this. Occidental did a reorganization, which um, uh, presumably is quite legal, and uh, as a result, uh, saved the, the organization an enormous amount of taxes. In fact, uh, the, the, the net gain from that reorganization was almost $2 billion. As a result of this legal entity reorganization, management made an adjustment to the tax basis in a portion of its operating assets, thus reducing Occidental's deferred tax liabilities. Accordingly, in 2022, Occidental recorded a tax benefit overall $2.7 billion in connection with this reorganization. So, be very, very careful when uh, you judge Occidental based on its 2022 returns because two of the primary reasons why Occidental stocks soared uh, last year, right up to the $70, uh, $70 per share, $70,000 would be nice, $70 per share or thereabouts. Two primary factors in that, or maybe three. Uh, firstly, the price of the commodity. Secondly, the uh, large buyers from uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And thirdly, uh, this windfall of $2.7 billion as a result of a uh, reorganization, which is basically just pushing paper around, right? So effectively what they did was they didn't necessarily do any business or make more money or make more sales. They did some paper shuffling, reorganized the business and uh, got themselves a tax deferred write-off uh, valued at almost $3 billion, right? It's a good position to be in. Let's take a look here at their statements. I'm still on the 10K, by the way. Revenue and other incomes, look at net sales. Great increase 2020 to 2021 to 2022. However, to be fair, Occidental has been producing approximately 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 million barrels of oil equivalent per day. That has not changed much at all. The price that you see here in terms of the net sales increase is primarily as a result of the increase in commodity prices. That's what I added. That's why I added this green arrow here. Year over year, we saw great increases in sales but it's primarily as a result of the higher price of the commodity. Now, if you look at the bottom where it says expense items, you can actually see almost the same type of jump or leap from year to year, except from 2020 to 2021, it's, it's very, very little. But if uh, you look from 2021, we're talking about oil and gas operating expense from 3 billion to 4 billion. Well, that's a 33 and a third percent almost increase year over year in just oil and gas operating expense. Here's another one, purchased commodities, right? A jump for, of $1 billion from 2020 to 2021, and then another jump of $1 billion from 2021 to 2022. There's not a lot they can do about this. And when we look at these numbers, we're looking at earnings effectively, these are expense items, but um, effectively it impacts your earnings before interest, demortiz uh, um, amortization, taxes, et cetera, EBITDA, right? So that's why I highlighted here, taxes, depreciation, amortization, and interest, EBITDA, right? So earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, those uh, latter names, let me just go back there for a second. Um, taxes, I talked about, uh, including the $2.7 billion def de um, Windfall, depreciation and amortization is arguably more or less the same thing. And of course, interest is interest. Um, the uh, items on your on your uh, 
profit and loss is not, not impacted by things like depreciation or amortization. It gives you the ability to write off uh, some of your profits for tax purposes, but uh, you're not putting any money in the bank. Cash on hand, as of December 31, 2022, Occidental had approximately $1 billion in cash and cash equivalents. That is ridiculous. It's quite pathetic. In fact, um, given the uh, enormous cash flow that they generated while the commodity price was high, they should be sitting on a, an absolute mountain of cash. And I know they purchased uh, repurchased shares, and I know that they paid off a, a, a big chunk of debt. It doesn't matter. They were making money hand over fist and, and uh, coming out of uh, 2022 for the year. They only had $1 billion of cash and cash equivalents. You might say, well, that's a lot of money. Well, is it really? In the scope of uh, managing a business like Occidental Petroleum, $1 billion is chicken feed. It's not a lot of money at all. Occidental currently expects its operational cash flows and cash on hands to be sufficient to meet the current debt maturities. Really? I don't think so. You're fly flying way too close to the sun and other obligations for the next 12 months from the date of this filing. 12 months is okay because it's relatively short term. Should commodity prices return to their 2020 lows, Occidental's $4 billion cash flow, receivable security facility, securitization facility, and access to capital markets. Uh, Oxia has a $5 billion facility that they have not drawn against yet, but that's debt, right? Should be sufficient to meet its ongoing capital needs, purchase obligations, near debt maturities, and other liabilities and financial obligations if required. Occidental's plan 2023 capital uh, capex, so capital expenditures, is between approximately $5.4 billion and $6.2 billion. Uh, I'm going to guide towards the uh, $6 billion range here rather than the $5 billion range. Uh, I wouldn't even be surprised if they exceed that in this hyperinflationary climate that we are in right now. Now, let's... Uh, move a, a little bit ahead and, and look at the fourth quarter results, right? So now I'm going to the 8K as opposed to the 10K. The 10K was the 2022 filing. This is the quarterly filing. Uh, we know now that they purchased $3 billion worth of shares and uh, they've authorized an additional uh, 3 billion shares to be repurchased with 562 million of repurchases in the fourth quarter. So total repurchase, 47.7 million shares. Um, also an increase of 38% in the common dividend. I talked about that at the start. So it's 18 cents per share per quarter, which is 72 cents per year, which as I said, with my cost basis is yielding about 6%. So I might just keep it uh, as opposed to dumping Occidental at this moment in time. For those of you who met me three to five years ago, uh, you will re probably remember that I said my typical holding period for uh, an equity that I own uh, is about three to five years. So uh, Occidental is now kind of teetering on the brink for me. So like, do I keep it? Yes or no? Uh, right now, the answer is hold. And the answer is hold because of the two reasons that I've now mentioned a couple of times. Firstly, I have a cost basis and I have a $60 stock, which is a 5x return for me. And in addition to that, the uh, equity now, the issuer is paying me a dividend of 72 cents, which on my cost basis is yielding 6%. So I'll sit on it and, and uh, see what happens from this point forward. Oxy repaid $1.1 billion worth of debt and retired $450 million of interest rate swaps during the fourth, fourth quarter with total year debt repayments of over $10.5 billion, representing 37% of total outstanding principal. Excellent job by the management. Well done. Uh, pretty much using all the cash they generated in order to service debt and keeping just $1 billion in the bank, which is not enough cash. Capital spending of 1.5 billion, resulting in quarterly free cash flow before working capital of 2.6 billion. It's all right, you know, it's not great. Uh, we've seen them generate uh, free cash flow uh, of significantly greater than that during the time when the commodity price was much higher. And um, I would have thought by now the uh, combination of Occidental and, and Darko has reached a level of maturity where they would be able to manage the uh, the integrated assets better and thereby reduce their costs significantly. And what I mean by that, just for clarity, is that when you acquire a company, you are effectively merging two organizations, which includes two sales departments, two marketing departments, two financial departments, two HR departments, et cetera, right? So uh, unless you are really, really ignorant in terms of how business works, which I don't think Occidental's management is, uh, there's no reason for you to have a ballooning uh, administrative uh, function to support your business. So effectively, you can almost say, I can do the same job I did before with one marketing department, one financial department, one HR department. And unfortunately, uh, the people who uh, 
are the victims of a merger like that um, will typically need to find themselves work somewhere else when those two companies merge. Uh, that's not a happy statement. It's just a statement as a matter of fact. Earnings per diluted share of $1.74. You know, just a few uh, days ago, in fact, about a week ago on the back of my napkin, I was kind of uh, thinking that Oxy could probably come in at around $2 EPS. And, uh, uh, you know, the uh, analyst uh, estimate was 187 or 184 or something like that. And Oxy missed that by 12%. And not a good performance, right? This is their highlights, really. They're basically saying, uh, uh, you know, I mean, this is one of their slides, right? So they're saying highlights from the fourth quarter performance, $2.6 billion in free cash flow. It's okay. $1.6 billion balance, balance sheet improvement. That's a good thing. $3 billion share repurchase program completed. Well, uh, it didn't even uh, move the stock. If anything, it moved the stock lower. So uh, you're going to have to wait and see what the effect is on that one. And sometimes it takes some time when those repurchase shares, which now, by the way, go onto the balance sheet uh, as treasury shares. So if you're looking for the repurchase shares, you're wondering where they are on the balance sheet, it's called treasury. Oil and gas production of 1.2 million barrels of oil equivalent per day. I alluded to that a little earlier when I said for the past you know, two, three years, they haven't produced much more than about 1.2, 1.3. And in fact, I think 1.4 was about the highest they got to. Uh, so this for them is a highlight, 1.2 million barrels of oil equivalent per day. It's kind of like, man, Oxychem, or Oxychem always gets a special mention because of the pre-tax income, in this case of $457 million. It's pretty good, right? But unfortunately, it's too small to have a very significant impact on Occidental Petroleum. Let's uh, take a quick look here at the uh, net income. So uh, when you look at the net income quarter over quarter, look what happened to Occidental in 2022. In Q1, we reported income uh, attributable to common shareholders of 4.6 billion and dropped down to 3.5 in Q2 to 2.5 in Q3. And for Q4, only $1.7 billion. Uh, this is almost like a miniature little collapse uh, during a time when arguably they should have been making more and more and more money. So the reported income decline is quite significant. You can do the math if you want. If you go back four quarters, you take Q4, 1.7 divided by 4.6. Whoops. Adjusted income attributable to common shareholders. So Okay, so this is our uh, income that they are actually showing us as the uh, common shareholders, right? 2.1 billion up to 3.2, down to 2.4. Now only $1.6 billion. The average shares outstanding Let's call it a billion, right? So it was at a peak at around 1 billion 18. Now it's at around about 1 billion shares, just shy of 1 billion diluted shares outstanding, which makes the math kind of easy because it's 1 billion, so you can divide by one. Worldwide oil, the price is $91 in Q1. So look what happens here. So commodity price realization, worldwide oil per barrel, dollar, dollars per barrel. In the first quarter, it's $91, I call it $92 per barrel, and Oxy generates $4.6, $4.7 billion in reported income. The next quarter, it's much higher, $107 per barrel average, and Oxy drops a billion. The next quarter, it's $94, $95 per barrel, and Oxy drops another billion dollars. Then the price of uh, worldwide oil drops by another $10 down to 83 and Oxy drops by another $1 billion. Right there at the bottom, you can see the CapEx, even though they've been managing it tightly and doing as best they can, from Q1, 858, the reason why it's in brackets is because it's an expenditure, right? So it's kind of like a loss, not a loss, it's just money you spent, so it's a negative. 858, 972, 1147, 1520. There is nothing that you can cut, do to cut costs when everything around you is increasing. Look at this one, reported income loss, right? So this is income for us, oil and gas. Look at the income, Q1, 2.5. Q2 jumps to 3.3. Q3 drops to 2.6. Q4 down to 1.9, all right? It's a, quite a sharp decline. And uh, this was during a period, as I said, when you would expect the uh, uh, merged entity between um, the integrated assets of Occidental and Anadarko to start delivering some shareholder value, right? That's what you expect when you do mergers and acquisitions. You expect to deliver shareholder value because as you integrate the, the assets, 
you have the ability to cut costs and generate more revenue, arguably at lower um, costs, making your uh, margins higher. Uh, this is not materializing here, not in the way it should be. This picture should be looking significantly better than what it looks right now. Net income or loss attributable to common shareholders. So there's your 1.7 billion. So the net income down from 4.6 to 3.5 to 5, 2.5 to 1.7. And as I said on the previous slide, uh, if there's a billion shares outstanding. So it makes the math really easy because that's how you end up with $1.74 earnings per share. But look at the reported diluted income per share. Q1 last year, 465, 347, 252. 174. Current assets, cash and cash equivalents. So I mentioned this a minute ago. This is horrible. So for 2022, they started the first, sorry, ended the first quarter with almost $2 billion cash in the bank. Oxy was making money hand over fist. I'm not criticizing the management for paying down debt. And I'm not even criticizing the management for buying back shares. Those are two things I think were the right thing to do. Um, but in the greater scheme of things, when you look at the macro situation, from an accounting point of view, this business does not look great, right? So when you're making a lot of money because the commodity prices are high and you're maintaining production at that sort of average 1.2 million barrels of oil equivalent per day, why on earth do you have a cash situation that drops quarter over quarter from 1.9 to 1.3 to 1.2 to less than $1 billion at the end of December 2022? Uh, this is not a good picture. Total current assets. Current assets are basically cash cash equivalents plus all the inventories. You can't you know, pay your debt with inventory, right? You have to sell your inventory to make money. So uh, arguably, it's nice to have inventory on hand because otherwise you would have nothing to sell, but it's not cash in the bank, right? But if you take all those current assets collectively, $10 billion down to $8.8 .8 billion. This is our balance sheet, right? This is one side of the ledger. You have all the assets and right at the bottom of the screen, you can see what our assets look like as owners of oxygen or petroleum. Over the four quarters of 2022, our asset value was steady at around 74 billion, then it dropped to 72 and ended the year at $72 billion, which means our value of the company in terms of what the company is worth overall uh, declined over the four quarters of 2022 by approximately $2 billion. What about the other side of the balance sheet, which is the current liabilities and owner's equity? So assets are assets. I mean, obviously, uh, the company owns a variety of different assets. Liabilities are debt. And then uh, if you deduct the current liabilities and the long-term debt from the assets, then you are left with owner's equity. So let's see what that looks like, because at least that gives us a little bit of a better picture and something to be happy about. Total current liabilities. Uh, sort of static, right? So 8.7 billion went up to 9.7 billion, dropped back down to eight and finished the year at around eight, 7.7 .7 billion dollars. Total deferred credits and other liabilities. We started with deferred credit and other liabilities of almost 15 billion and ended the year at 15 billion. Not a big change there, right? The only really big change is over here, which is the one I did not highlight. We started the year with 25, almost 26 billion dollars in long-term debt. And by the end of the year, it was less than $20 billion. Good job management uh, on that particular line item on the balance sheet. However, if you want to do balance sheet repair, you need to repair the balance sheet, not one line item on the balance sheet. So I don't want to be overly critical because the uh, management has done a really good job during an enormously tough time, especially since no one could have foreseen the absolute collapse of the commodity market in 2020 as it relates to um, uh, oil. And in addition to that, the uh, ill-timed acquisition of Anadarko, which obviously, uh, arguably, if it hadn't been for the fact that there was a pandemic and the oil price collapsed, would have been a master stroke of genius by Vicky Holub and her team to acquire Anadarko instead of watching uh, Chevron walk away with Anadarko, uh, which has some of the most valuable assets in the Permian Basin in the Gulf of Mexico in terms of production. Right at the bottom of the screen is my almost my, my only solitary little highlights reel that uh, makes me feel good because total equity is us. This is what we own. This is what our company looks like. Right at the bottom of the screen, you can see that in Q1 of 2022, our equity was about $25 billion. 
And at the end of the year, we ended at about $30 billion. That's a $5 billion swing. And where did it come from? The long-term debt reduction, which is a $5 billion swing. So paid a $5 billion in long-term debt and increased our total equity by $5 billion, which is obviously the same amount of money. As for the rest of it, nothing to cheer about. So what's the uh, sort of market thesis today? I'm going to wrap it up with this one. So uh, what do the bulls say? Oxy has a dominant position in the Permian Basin. It's the cheapest source of production in the United States and expected to be a major growth engine in the next few years. I'd agree with that. Long-term projections show Oxy can deliver the same strong capital returns that many of its peers are already getting credit for. Now, I have a bit of a challenge with that because one of, uh, many of its peers are already getting credit for it, which is one of the reasons why I haven't been buying more Oxy. And I've rather been buying other energy stocks and of late, I've also even been buying some mining stocks. So um, in terms of where I'm at, my Occidental Petroleum position has been a hold for quite some time. But where I have added, for instance, in direct equities, uh, it includes Devon Energy. And in addition to that, um, by the way, don't worry about the fact that Devon's uh, sort of the bottom dropped out when they reported the last quarter, Devon will be okay. In fact, Devon is quite cheap now at 50 something bucks per share. Uh, but I have moved um, an, a large sum of money from my uh, individually held uh, energy equities into XLE. And uh, I don't often recommend that you buy anything at all, but if you're going to buy oil or whatever, you may as well just buy some XLE. You don't have to park everything there, uh, but you can certainly get some XLE. So, uh, I have a bit of a challenge with this line item here. Oxy can deliver the same strong capital returns returns that many of its peers are already getting credit for. Well, if many of the peers are already getting credit for it, maybe I want to buy some of those peers. The low carbon venture segment is synergistic. Well, I touched on that one briefly when I said Oxy low carbon ventures is a nice talking point for Vicky Hollip, but it brings in no money and it's going to be years before it actually generates any money, if at all, because we don't know, right? What do the bears say? Oxy's Permian wells exhibit very high initial production rates. They also decline very quickly. The EOR segment is very capital intensive and is a high cost source of production. Anadarko's acquisition of, uh, sorry, the Anadarko acquisition forced Oxy to prioritize the balance sheet while its peers were launching generous returns. Uh, and now Oxy is kind of trying to catch up. So guys, that's uh, sort of a wrap on Occidental Petroleum. Uh, I'm not going to go into... Uh, more depth on Occidental Petroleum. In fact, I'm probably not even going to wear my Mr. Oxy cap uh, for the next few weeks or months or so until I uh, kind of either fall in or out of love with Occidental Petroleum again. Uh, but that's where I'm at. I'm just giving it to you as best I can, uh, unbiased as possible. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking in the marketplace to see uh, where I can uh, allocate capital, where I perhaps have not allocated some capital before. Most of you uh, will know if you've been following my channel that I uh, in, uh, attended the uh, mining investment uh, conference in South Africa a couple of weeks ago. So I was awake, away for a while. Uh, I have looked at some of those stocks. Um, I have uh, invited several mining company CEOs to join me on the channel. A few of them have agreed to do so. Uh, and when they see their peers making an appearance on our little channel so that they can speak directly to our investor community, Others may join, I'm not sure, I don't know. Uh, I do have another video which is currently in production because uh, I wanted to share with you the one-to-one -one group uh, and how they work in terms of connecting people like us to um, mining company CEOs in this particular example. Uh, I did record a video with one-to-one uh, -one group last Friday and they very kindly sent it to their marketing department to uh, make sure it looks really good and flashy and fancy before uh, they send it to me to upload to our channel. So that won't be coming soon, maybe uh, as soon as tomorrow or the next day uh, of this week. So uh, that's where I'm at anyway with Occidental Petroleum. I still have a, uh, a very uh, nice, diversified, large portfolio of energy stocks. Most of these stocks are familiar to you because I've spoken about them many times before. I have Enbridge, which is a, uh, an integrated oil and gas company out of Canada. I have Pembina which is a pipelines company. I have energy transfer. I have a huge amount of money. It's my largest position in XLE. I have a large position in Occidental Petroleum. And uh, of late, I've been adding uh, to my uranium stocks as well. I have a few uranium stocks there as well. Uh, uranium for me is not mining, it's more energy. So uh, I've added to uh, that little slither of my pie chart 
in the energy bucket as well. Uh, so that's where I'm at. If you have any questions or comments, I look forward to interacting with you. And uh, if you have questions, I'll try and answer them as best I can. If you have comments, uh, and uh, if you can tell me why Occidental is fantastic, I'd love to hear it. If you want to tell me why Occidental sucks, you can tell me that too. It'll be fun. Uh, anyway, that's where I'm at. That's my unbiased view. And that's uh, the wrap on Occidental's 2022. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.